Sometimes, after a long day at work, you just want to go home and have dinner with the family, then sneak off to see a prostitute. But in Japan's Edo period, things were not so easy. Betting a top courtesan in the pleasure district was a whole quest that took days, weeks, even months, and came with a million unspoken rules. And everyone pitied the fool who broke these rules, because it came with harsh consequences. The first speed bump on your highway to whorish heaven was money. If you didn't have money, you were out of luck. And if you did, you were soon out of money. The best ladies were not cheap, and not paying led to humiliating punishments. The highest ranking ladies of pleasure charged around 40 times that of the lowest ladies of budget. Sunrise was a magical time for brothels, a time where money can double, and they hated it. Here's why. Whether a client's visit with a high-class lady was as short as a haiku or as long as an epic poem, it cost the same. But if he stayed past sunrise the next morning, he was charged an extra full day. Some men went to the Red Lantern District more than I go to boba tea shops and saw themselves as sophisticated Romeo-sons. They thought that staying past sunrise was cool and stylish, probably because it showed that they didn't care about money and didn't have to rush out in the morning. Everyone in the brothel hated these people. The courtesan couldn't get a break from her job, and the staff had to take care of Mr. Elegant Oversleeper over here, instead of doing their morning routine. Lower-ranked prostitutes met clients for shorter blocks of time. If there's one fact that best shows you the atmosphere of the pleasure quarters, it's this. If the brothel overcharged someone, he usually didn't complain. Why? Because in that world, spending money was a fashion statement. Coin was in the air, and air was in your pockets. Overcharging me a hundred dollars? How dare you? Here, have another hundred. That was during the peak of prostitution, though. Later in the Edo period, the party ended. Customers stopped making it rain, and instead made it a bit of a drizzle. It became trendy to be frugal, and people bragged about how little they got away with spending. The pleasure district was a place of complex rules, and being a client of a top courtesan was as complicated as the lies he told his wife. There were many rules about how a client should act. Most of these were not laws you had to obey, they were unwritten rules enforced by those around you, so they really had to be obeyed. The strictest rules are the unwritten ones. Let me lead you down a typical first date with an A-list courtesan, from the restaurant all the way to her bedroom, and further beyond. Think of a simple first meeting at a coffee shop and throw it out the window. It was actually a tricky dance of etiquette and coin, where the wrong move could ruin your life. Let me know if it's similar to first dates you've had. Now, one does not simply walk into a brothel. You had to treat it like seeing your dentist. Book an appointment months ahead, but if it's urgent, slip the receptionist some money to bump someone else's spot. In the courtesan community, this was called yielding. Popular ladies of pleasure were booked for months, but if a client's balls were the right shade of blue, he could pay a fee to free up a slot. The brothel manager would ask a scheduled client to yield to the latecomer, so the latecomer could turn into an earlycomer. The client, who had been waiting forever, would have to wait forever more, but if he said yes, people would have called him a truly classy and generous man. And what more do you need in life? Once in a while, a latecomer born with heaps of audacity would do something crazy. He would ask someone already there waiting to yield. It was a bold request because the yielder still had to pay without even meeting the courtesan. The audacious man might offer to pay the yielder for the trouble, and the house would give the poor guy another lady to share the evening with, just not to share a bed with. Getting an appointment was just a start. When the date came, one mistake could have ruined you. A top courtesan didn't see patrons at her brothel. She wasn't some second-rate girl who slept with men where she slept. Instead, the client went to an exclusive establishment called an agea. Now, if you stepped into an agea, you would have been stomped on and kicked out, and would have lost any chance to get stomped on and kicked. No, this was no place for any regular Joe Shmobunaga off the street. To enter this Garden of Heden, a client needed a golden ticket, which came in the form of a recommendation from a respected tea house. They only wanted high-quality guests, the quality here being money. An agea served food and drinks and had luxurious bedrooms decked out with different themes. Rooms might open into a garden, maybe a pond, maybe a bridge to a little island, perfect for couples to lay down, enjoy the view, and recite poetry to each other while listening to the sweet sounds of their neighbors having sex. I've seen scholarly papers give different names to describe an agea, like a meeting house or a house of assignation, which don't really get the point across. That's why you have me. 
and Agaya was a luxury love hotel for clients and courtesans. The client went in and ordered some food and drink for his crew while he waited for the courtesan. He was expected to order some entertainment, like a geisha to play music and sing. In an agaya, men spread their wallets wider than a courtesan's sash. He was a peacock, spreading his tail feathers made from sophistication and generosity. How much did he buy? How much did he tip? The eyes of the staff and the other patrons were on him like plates on a table. In the pleasure quarters, words travel faster than syphilis. Unlucky men who screwed up badly, like being drunk and violent with a courtesan, found themselves unpopular, their lives seemingly over. And as they walked through the valley of the shadow of breasts, they took a look at their lives and realized it's all a mess. So while the client waited, the courtesan walked with her crew from her brothel to the agea and began the meeting ritual. Every little action in this ritual had more meaning than your relationship. She sat in an important spot, while Mr. Client sat in a sad inferior place near the entrance. She sat diagonally from him, not speaking or smiling or looking, treating him like a cheerleader treats a chess leader. He not only had to buy her dinner, he had to buy the food and drink for her crew, too. You invite someone out for a drink, and you end up paying for her whole ass friend group. The mistress of the Agea began the drinking ritual. She gave the courtesan a cup, a cup holding sake and the fate of the client. The courtesan could refuse it, rejecting the man. Maybe he didn't seem sophisticated enough, or didn't tip well, maybe he was rude. But in reality, the lady almost never refused. To behead a man's ego in front of so many sharp eyes and loose mouths, that's cold-blooded. Also, ain't no working girl ever made money from not working. Most of these women were trapped under a velvet blanket of debt. The trick was to give the illusion that she could reject anyone to maximize her allure. Just another day at the orifice. So the courtesan would take a sip. Then the mistress gave the cup to the client, who also sipped. At this point, he would have been bouncing in his boots, excited as a schoolboy on his first day getting laid. After some time partying it up, sipping on gin and juice, the client and courtesan entered one of the rooms in the agea and did something you might not expect. They enjoyed some conversation, some poetry, and yes, got under the sheets, and she drifted off to sleep, while he lay in the company of a familiar friend named Frustration. No self-respecting courtesan gave it up on the first date. To reject him, she might position a lamp in some way, turn her back to him in bed, or even not get in the bed at all. Most clients knew this was the game, the ritual, but knowing is one thing, experiencing another. It must have been hard for patrons to lie next to their object of desire, yet be barred from her valley of the shadow of breasts. That sexual frustration was sweet torture that only made clients crave more. The client had to see her all over again, twice more. Only on the third night did she let him go all the way. After this third time, everything changed. The man became a najimi. A regular partner, or a familiar partner, a VIP to the club of her heart. She was also called his Najimi. They became more intimate, called each other by first names, wow. But with great intimacy comes great responsibility. A Najimi client had his own rules to follow. All these rules and expectations were the fuel that ran the Red Lantern District. A machine that milked as much coin from clients as possible. Love is a profitable business. Many a man lost his life's savings. The number one commandment for a Najimi? Thou shalt not cheat on thy courtesan. Like God, brothel managers struck down the heathens who broke this commandment, who strayed from the path of grace to wallow in the depths of orgasmic lust and wickedness. We'll see the punishments for cheaters in a bit. Coincidentally, this rule benefited brothels by helping them not lose customers to rival brothels. Clients did not just buy sex, they bought relationships. Men competed to shower gifts and money at these ladies, hoping to be chosen as Najimi. Truth was, becoming Najimi wasn't as rare as they had people think. Most men got that closer bond. And when a client finally became Najimi, he was satisfied to just stay with his courtesan while he pursued another. Scientists have recently made a surprising discovery. Turns out the laws of physics were violated in the pleasure quarters, allowing gossip to travel faster than the speed of light. A Najimi who cheated was soon found out, and any man who left his courtesan for a lady of another brothel house also got in trouble. Brothels got creative with punishments. A courtesan had her people capture the treacherous man and held court, with her girls interrogating him. If homeboy played dumb, they pulled off his clothes and dressed him in a little girl's outfit and drew ink on his face. They tied him up and laughed at him until he confessed. If she was really mad, she might do the unthinkable. She'd cut off his top knot. Not only was this shameful, it made it hard to explain to his wife. Honey, I was at the department store and fell. 
into a box of scissors. If he did confess, all was forgiven. All he had to do was pay everyone there and order a new kimono for the courtesan. With these extreme, horrific punishments, it's a wonder that any client cheated at all. It actually doesn't seem that uncommon, because there were barbers who set up shop just outside the pleasure district that specialized in restoring hair, making toupees that were almost but not quite completely unconvincing. There was one peculiar practice that is still done today in some unlucky countries, and the pleasure quarters took it to a whole new level. Tipping. In the United States, at a restaurant, you're expected to tip 15 to 20 percent. Unless the service is especially atrocious, like your pasta came with a side of cockroach or something, then you would only tip 15 percent. But in Edo Japan's pleasure quarters, when you met an elite courtesan, you had to tip the staff, the manager, the agaya owner and his wife, the courtesan's crew, even the lantern carrier. You only got to sleep with the courtesan on the third visit, but they expected tips from the very first meeting. And when tipping one of the lady entertainers, you couldn't just hand them coins like you were feeding pigeons. You had to put the money in a small box and give it to her subtly, like don't call any attention to it. Or with the main courtesan, you slip it under her pillow. If you only brought enough for the price of a night with a courtesan, you fucked up, son. Japanese cranes can fly high, but the cost of tipping could soar over nine times the price of a courtesan. And what happened to cheap tippers? Remember that gossip broke the speed of light. Their reputations would have been shattered, or at least they would have been quite embarrassed. For those born allergic to tipping, they could go to the low-quality discount brothels on the outskirts of the district, where tipping was not in the vocabulary. Clients of these places not only didn't tip, they sometimes forgot to pay. It became a big enough problem that patrons who came and dashed were subjected to a most embarrassing punishment. If one such miserable shit penis was caught, he was tossed in a big barrel with a hole on the side and put somewhere public for people to point and laugh at. They cut that punishment out after a while because people thought it was too cruel. Brothels started taking the non-payer's belongings and selling them, even his sword and clothes. The capital city of Edo passed a law that you couldn't take someone's clothes because it would cause him to lose his dignity. And it worked, about as well as a chocolate condom. Brothels didn't stop. When the payment dodger was particularly stubborn, the brothel would hire a collection agency or sell the debt to them. These guys would hold the man hostage somewhere and go to his house to collect the debt, dealing with his family while they demonstrate the ancient Japanese art of awkwardly shuffling their feet. If they couldn't collect enough, they took the client's clothes and sent him home in a cheap kimono or a towel. Because look, a courtesan's life wasn't easy, a girl's gotta bring home the money. In this video, we've talked about things from the client's point of view, but you won't get a full picture until you see it from the courtesan's point of view, what was really happening behind those fluttering eyes and painted smiles. Click here to learn about that. We have some new patrons on Patreon this week, Izu Siafik, Kermi, Tim, and Richard Anaya. You're all amazing. Alright, I love you and spread the knowledge.